Hey, good afternoon. David Thompson, lecturer for Entrepreneurship 407, Entrepreneurship Hour. I'm really excited about today. In fact, I think today is going to be one of um, the most interesting for a lot of reasons. I'm, it's a pleasure to have Mike Daniels here, who will be our guest for most of the time, but also Marianne Beister. Marianne Beister is the daughter of Bob and Betty Beister. And for those of you that are familiar with the North Campus, we have the Bob and Betty Beister Computer Science Building right behind us. Um, Marianne is a part of the Foundation for Enterprise Development and has been inter integral in some of the programs that we do here at the University of Michigan. And so to introduce Mike Daniels, I'd like to have her come here and um, onto the Michigan stage. Marianne. Uh, hello, can you hear me? It's good? Okay. Um, so again, my name is Marianne Beister. I'm the president of the Foundation for Enterprise Development. So we're a nonprofit, and we're located in San Diego. And we focus on research curriculum, films, and books that uh, look at interesting stories of entrepreneurship, innovation, and and ownership. And um, I uh, uh, met Mike Daniels many years ago, but started working with with Mike about five years ago. Um, because he and my father had done a very interesting internet deal. They'd done a number of internet deals, but one in particular um, we wanted to highlight through, uh, through a book. And that's the Network Solutions story, and um, that, will, that, that was the company that uh, was responsible for the domain name systems. And so we have been working together now for, for five years on... on, on uh, getting this story about how do you convert a technology that was funded by the federal government and commercialize it. And also how to survive exponential growth as an, as an entrepreneur. And there's many other uh, stories that he'll, that, that, that were captured in the book and that uh, Mike will, will share. Um, I think the interesting thing is, one of the interesting things is about um, this, this uh, journey that we've had together, which is really a research and documentation and publishing of a book, is this project took a, just about as long as it took for them to acquire Network Solutions from um, the company that uh, uh, Mike was working at, which was SEIC with my father, and, and then selling the company. So that was kind of, I don't think it was as intensive on in the book, uh, but it's been a wonderful journey to, to uh, uh, have had for the last five years and um, we had just released this, um, this book, and it's available, and this is our first stop on our book tour, and we're so glad to, to be here. So thank you for University of Michigan, and I'll let you guys begin. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be with you in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I want to start by those of you who want to listen to the whole story, I'm going to do about five or seven minutes of an introductory overview, tell you what it's about. And then David and I are going to have a conversation with Q&A. Um, it's, it's a story that really goes to the heart of something each and every one of you uses every single day, and that's the internet. And I happen to be uh, at the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is an agency of the Department of Defense in Washington, D.C. That is the agency that has probably come up with more advanced technology that's found its way into multi-billion and trillion dollar industries across the world as a result of government funding than any agency of the United States government. Uh, this is an agency that's come up with things like GPS, uh, satellite communication, video teleconferencing, the internet, and on and on and on. So this book, which is called Names, Numbers, and Network Solutions, the Monetization of the Internet, uh, really begins for me in 1969. Now, I know you don't think I look that old, but I went to Washington in the United States Navy out of graduate school at Northwestern in 1969. This was the agency that in 1962 came up with a concept through some very smart science and technology people around this country to talk about a global network that might connect people in some way, shape, or form. I happened to be assigned there in 1969 when 
ARPA, it was called in those days, Advanced Research Projects Agency, now DARPA, turned on the switch for the first users group of the ARPANET. And that's the thing that became the internet. Um, I was there for two years. I used this technology. I got to know people like Bob Kahn, Vince Cerf, the fathers of the internet. They've been good friends of ours for all those years. I followed the development of that uh, through a couple of evolutions of companies that we built, and one being SAIC. Bob Beister founded it. It was grown to be the largest science technology services company that was privately held, employee owned, in the United States of America. We built that to an $11 billion, 44,000 person co company, headquartered in La Jolla, and now headquartered at Tyson's Corner, Virginia, after many years. New York Stock Exchange Company today. That was a great, great success as the largest company of its type in science and technology in the country. Uh, I sold my company that I'd built to SAIC in December of 1986, and I went to SAIC and then worked with Bob and everybody as we built SAIC. So when I joined SAIC in 1986, I had 270 technical people in my company, and we were about $500 million at SAIC. So you can see what happened in those years from 500 million to 11 billion. I happened to meet through a lawyer friend of mine who'd handled my deal with SAIC, um, a company called Network Solutions. This was a small startup that started in, in Washington, D.C. in 1979. This was a company that had been a small business to provide networking and other technical services to the United States government and a few commercial companies. The end of that story is I got to know the owners, I befriended them, I continued to watch the evolution of this thing called the internet through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And in 1993, this company, Network Solutions, won a cooperative agreement from the National Science Foundation. The National Science Foundation does not give contracts, it gives cooperative agreements, grants, and they gave this company, a small business, doing about $12 million worth of business, the exclusive right to sell .com, .org, and .net to every human being on Earth. There were three important things about this company that I then purchased a far SAIC in March of 1995 when it was doing about $14 million worth of revenue and was losing money. This is a company that only made money one year from its inception in 1979 to when I purchased it for SAIC in 1995. The three things that are important about this company is uh, this company had that right to sell the domain names to every human being and, and organization on earth. Number two, we were the people for those five years while we owned this company that built out the entire infrastructure for the internet that allowed every human being on earth every day and night to type in a web address, we were the people who connected it to the underlying IP address. Without network solutions, nobody on earth could get on the internet. It was the most important function that we performed, and it's the same way today with a company called VeriSign, which is who we sold network solutions to in 2000 at the height of the internet boom. Number three, we worked with the United States government up to Bill Clinton, who was president at that time, Al Gore, uh, Bill Daly, who was Secretary of Commerce in the Clinton administration, to structure a 161 single-page agreement contract that laid out the entire governance structure for the internet worldwide. That document, which we created with our lawyers and the United States government, is still the framework to operate the entire internet today. So these are things that took many, many years to happen. Uh, I'll tell you the financial story, which is, uh, during the dot-com boom days, uh, Silicon Valley knew nothing about the internet. I can tell you that because I've lived and worked there. I haven't lived there, I've worked there and sold companies and been on boards in the valley uh, for over 35 years. There was no one in Silicon Valley who really understood the internet. They came to us in Washington because we did understand it. We'd worked with it and DARPA for many years they started to see the potential to commercialize it in the early 90s. I went to Silicon Valley, I hired myself a lawyer, I started to talk to investment bankers. So when I purchased this company in 1995 on behalf of SAIC and we owned it, 
We then took it public in the middle of the dot-com boom years. We took it public in 1997. Uh, we sold $69 million worth of stock on the stock exchanges. We were a NASDAQ publicly listed company at $18 a share. In 1999, two years later, uh, we went on the road show and we did the largest internet offering in history. We sold $779 million worth of stock in 1999. And in 2000, we went out for a third offering and we raised $2.3 billion on Wall Street. This was the largest ever pure internet offering in history. We sold Network Solutions in March of 2000 at the very height of the dot-com boom, the stock market high for the dot-com boom, uh, for $19.3 billion. I purchased that company for $4.7 million in March of 1995. It still holds a record today on Wall Street from a purchase to a sale in a five-year period. So for the stockholders that bought Network Solutions stock, in the rankings of what companies you wanted to buy their stock in the decade from 1993 to 2004, a 10-year period, we were the sixth highest appreciating stock over those years at 3,894%. So you wanted to be a stockholder in Network Solutions, I can tell you that. Uh, SAIC out of that got $2.3 billion in cash, which was the largest transaction in SAIC's history. So there are some lessons learned here, and I'm going to stop with a couple lessons learned for you because I'm an entrepreneur. I started my own company in Washington. Uh, I sweated day and night for years to pay, pay the payroll. I know what it's like to sign bank notes and have your wife and two kids and your car and your house hocked up to a bank. Uh, I've now helped company raise billions of dollars outside of Network Solutions and SAIC over the years. Uh, I know what it's like to have to go out and find the best technical and management talent in the world. I know what it's like to have to figure out the right strategy to go into a marketplace, hopefully globally, but domestically too. I know what it's like to have all kinds of political problems with the United States government, the United States Congress, to have to testify before the House and Senate about things that went on at Network Solutions in terms of what are you doing, how did you get this contract, on and on and on. Uh, the interplay between Washington as our central government and the technology industry has grown every single year I've been in this business for over 36 years. So lessons to be learned here. Number one, I want all of you to take away from this, if you have a chance to read the book and after you listen to us talk today, I want all of you to think about being an entrepreneur. There's no better life or thing to spend your time doing than being an entrepreneur. You will never find a greater livelihood or a greater career. Number two, I want you to think about the importance of business and the government working together. This could have never happened without the cooperation between a private company, Network Solutions, and all of us involved as senior management, and the United States government up to and including the White House. We negotiated for months and months and months. There were very difficult issues to resolve. The government and private sector have to work together. We have a situation in our country where it's gotten to be more confrontational. We can't get things decided in Washington. I've worked at the White House and the National Security Council. I know how it works there. We have got to find a way in this country to view business as a positive, positive force. Business is a positive force. The government's role in technology and science is to seed things. The private sector takes those activities and operationalizes those and creates trillions of dollars of wealth for the citizens of our country to buy cars, houses, educate their children. This is how the system works. The government does not ultimately operationalize any of that for wealth creation in our society. People need to understand that, that it's a positive thing in this country. And last but not least, I'd say this to you. Um, if you have any doubts about the science and technology field, I would say if you're not in that field, learn as much as you can about it. Because what I've learned in my years globally in this industry is it is always the career path of the future. We create the future in the technology industry. So think about those things as we talk about it today. And again, it's great to be with all of you. <laughs> so 
So a couple of class periods ago, we were talking about computer technology in the classroom, whether we should or should not. And so I have you to thank for the ability to email and text in class, right? <laughs> not, not just us, but we were one of the people. So I mean, this is really a remarkable opportunity, if, I don't, if you don't mind, Mike, to uh, talk with the students here, to be sitting here with someone who is a part of the genesis of something that we take for granted, almost like air. Um, the internet is just such a part of the fabric of our day-to-day -day lives um, that it's, it's almost impossible to imagine what it's like without it. <clears throat> so, so if you can, take, take me back to 1969, and you're sitting, uh, you're, with the, you're with the Navy, you're sitting with ARPA, and you're one of the first to sort of be able to, to see inside the box of this new thing that's ARPANET, which becomes later the internet. I mean, what were you thinking at that time, and did you predict that it would become what it has become today? Uh, it's a great question, David, and I'm sure I wasn't thinking it would become anything like it was today. Um, if, if anybody who was ever in the internet business in Silicon Valley or the Washington area or anybody ever tells you they could have predicted what happened, uh, don't believe them, because I knew every single one of them. Steve Case started up down the street from me at Tyson's Corner. Uh, I was on road shows right behind Jerry Yang at uh, Yahoo, on and on and on. No one ever knew that we would see what we've seen out of the internet. So when I was there in 69, I was so young, I didn't know what to think about it. I had a job to do in the Navy for the Advanced Research Projects Agency, but what I did know was this was very interesting because I had a technology background coming out of school, and I thought, this is a very interesting system. What we basically used it for, and most of you will not remember this, you had dumb terminals that you basically typed in strings of numbers, characters, and you were able to communicate with the researchers we used in that program in the ARPANET days at Southern California, Caltech, MIT, actually here at the University of Michigan, um, Bendix Aerospace, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we really didn't know what we were dealing with. But so, so there are individuals actually that have been given the label the father of the internet, Vent uh -huh. Cert, for example. Vent and Bob Scott, right. right. You're not one of those. You've done, so, you've done something a little bit different that, that, that actually made this possible, though, right? So from my understanding, so you, you built a company that was uh, purchased by SAIC. You're inside SAIC. And, and all of a sudden, you, through your relationships, learn about another company called Network Solutions. And um, Network Solutions had an agreement with, uh, with the US government through the National Science Foundation. I think it was Mark Coster's in, the, uh, right. uh, in Network Solutions that really pushed this, and Scott Williamson. They, ha they had basically a monopoly over domain names. So <laughs> take us back to that moment. When you learned that information, did light bulbs go off for you, or was that just sort of a, a flash in the pan at that moment? And, yeah, when I think a confluence of events, and I'd say, David, that you know what I think one of the things you need to think about in your career and you need to learn about is these are long waves of technology. Uh, great companies are built in the United States and globally over many, many years. They're typically not flashes in the pan. Um, I think when it first struck me was I'd watched the development of this technology through the federal government, and it moved from the Department of Defense to the National Science Foundation and ultimately to the Department of Commerce. So through those years to three separate agencies. Um, when I really, the light bulb went off for me was um, when Network Solutions won this competitive agreement at the end of 1992, because I'd been in Silicon Valley, I'd been following what had gone on with the NSF and this development of this, and I saw that there, I could, you could almost smell that the Silicon Valley folks were gonna start putting money into this thing called the internet although most did not understand what it was. By that time, a few did. Uh, Jim Clark and Mark Andreessen, who took the first company public, which was Netscape in 1994. So the light bulb went off for me that, because I knew enough about technically, that the keys to the kingdom for the internet were what I said earlier. Whoever controlled domain names, domain names were the post office and still are today for the global internet. That's where all the addresses are, and you gotta get the right thing to the right people, but controlling the A server, which populates every single day, any new address and IP uh, addresses on the internet is what makes us be able to connect to Facebook, Google, Yahoo, anything like that. 
that's the core of how this operates. And we had the core of how the internet was going to operate. Okay, so I, I want to read an excerpt from the book. Okay. And it's a press release about this uh, competitive agreement that okay. Network Solutions uh, was able to broker. So it says, Network Solutions anticipates the value of the registration services award to be approximately $5 million over five years. Under the cooperative agreement, the company will serve as a worldwide register for the non-military portions of the internet. Work will be performed at corporate headquarters in Herndon with dedicated staff of eight to nine. So when I read that, I sort of, it, you're underwhelmed. It, it just seems that people weren't expecting what actually was to follow. Yeah, n none of us expected what followed. Um, by 1995, as I recall, there were about a total of 60 or 70,000 domain names that had been registered. Think about that. People started registering domain names in the late 70s, mid to late 70s. So for almost 20 years, there were only 60 or 70,000 domain names that had ever been registered. 99% of the people in the world, even by 1995, didn't have a clue what the internet was or a domain name while this was becoming something that now permeates everybody's life. So, no, we anticipated that, you know, there would be some ramp up. We didn't know how significant it would be. And, you know, eight or nine people at that time seemed to us like a lot of technical people to handle the domain name system. <laughs> so what, what happened? What, what made it change? Uh, what happened was two things. Number one was once Silicon Valley started putting money into this and Netscape went public in 94, the press started to pick it up people could actually go and get a domain name and get on the internet. So that started it. It really didn't start to roll until about 95, 96. Um, the second thing that happened was we started to publicize who Network Solutions was. And um, we said, come to us. We're the people you have to. So we started, slowly but surely, to get 100 inquiries a day from all over the world. We would like soap.com, we'd like cars.com, we'd like, you know, uh, whatever.com, houses.com, real estate. And we saw this as interesting. We'd follow this every day, literally, about the ramp up. And then it started to become a small flood by about 1996 or 97. So we went from, you know, eight or nine people handling this to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And we set up call centers because people were calling into us from all over the globe. And we had to have language experts who ended up having to speak 62 different languages. Because people all over the world were slowly, by the end of the 90s, starting to wake up to, if you don't have a domain name, you've got a problem. It's a personal domain name, so I can use the internet, or I need a company domain name. By then, the internet boom, and most of you did not live through that time period, there was this massive run-up in the stock market that was a, called the internet bubble. And values went sky high uh, in that period. So the confluence of these kind of things, money being put in, lots of publicity, and people starting to wake up to this thing called the internet started to really mm. boom these kinds of businesses. Okay, so you, you weren't a part of the founding members of Network Solutions. You were, you were inside SAAC. A couple of things were happening simultaneously, um, at least from what I'm getting from the book. On one hand, you had Network Solutions, which was a relatively small company as companies go. I mean, I think they had four or 500 staff. Very so small. Um, uh, relative to an SAC that, that was small. Um, and and they, were, they were starting to lose their capacity to keep a handle on and keep up with the flow of, of potential growth, not only in this space, but other places. So they were having a capacity issue, it sounds mm -hmm. like. Simultaneously, as, as the market is starting to become aware of uh, the, the need to have domain names, the NSF, which had, which had brokered with uh, Network Solutions a, a cost plus fee agreement, was, was also under pressure because they weren't able to keep up with the demand. So it seems like, the, seems like um, it, it was at that sort of inflection point that you and SAIC started having conversations with Network Solutions about, well, is this the time to acquire, and can you talk to us a little bit about sort of that dynamic and whether that was instrumental in the negotiations as you were uh, considering the acquisition? Yeah, that's a great question because Network Solutions, again, was a company that just didn't make money, and uh, they just hadn't been able to do that. Uh, so they were under financial pressure. When we actually bought Network Solutions, uh, they basically had $50,000 in the bank, 
you know, their payroll was bigger than that. They were running out of money, and they saw there was no way they could do this kind of stuff. Even though the boom hadn't started, they were getting a trickle of that. Um, number two was, um, I, I would say that um, we, in talking to the National Science Foundation, the National Science Foundation as a government agency had never seen anything like this. They had no idea how to handle it. So we spent many months negotiating with them about a financial structure that would be viable for the federal government and for network solutions to keep us in business to allow us to do things. So yes, everybody was under pressure and we at SAIC that were by then a big company, we had the financial, technical, and management smarts to be able to come in and do something like this. Well certainly the, the scaling of call centers and things like that, it seems that network solutions would have never been in the position with its current financial uh, or its existing financial structure to absorb that, whereas SAIC comes in, acquires, and has resources to bear to bring that, uh, that out. The decision of uh, uh, the National Science Foundation to ultimately allow uh, network solutions under SAIC to monetize or charge for domain names wasn't a simple one, though. Uh, it ha also happened under pressure. Um, in fact, was pretty political. Can you talk to us about the politics that were happening there? Very political, and the point we make in the book is uh, you should really start to understand as you get into your career, I don't care what career path you pursue, you need to understand the political system in this country, and you need to work with it, and you need to educate people that are in the political system before you need them about your business and your business interests. And I say that in a very positive way. That's part of the role of business. Um, the National Science Foundation uh, looked to us to tell them what kind of financial model made sense because the government is not in the business of funding a private company to ramp up to handle millions of domain names. They'd never seen anything like this. So, so we had to come up with a financial structure, a legal structure, and a policy structure for various parts of this, because no one had ever done this before in the history of the world. This was brand new with the internet. Um, the politics of it uh, were excruciating, I can tell you that. Um, you know, we thought it was a great thing that we'd been smart enough to acquire network solutions. We didn't know what it was going to be when we acquired it or what it would become. Uh, the news media loved this story. So the front pages of the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, all had front page stories about there's this little company called Network Solutions in Herndon, Virginia that holds the keys to the internet kingdom. How in the world did they ever get this contract with the United States government? That led us to everything from months and months long negotiations with the Department of Commerce to structure the agreement I talked about earlier about how we would all operate the U.S. government, the domain name system, ICANN, which is the body we funded to set up to govern, which is still the governing body worldwide for the internet everywhere. Um, and also, uh, we testified a number of times on Capitol Hill. The politicians always get interested in things like this, and that's, they should. We were totally transparent, but um, there were lots of questions about, you know, how did this ever happen? How did you guys get this? It was all very straightforward. It was a competitive procurement. Network Solutions bid on it. Anybody in the country could have bid on it. And when they bid on it, there were only six people in this entire company, country in 1992 who bid to be able to be the exclusive reseller of .com, .org, .net. People just didn't get this. They didn't see it. So, so there were also some of the early users of the internet were more in the sort of ARPA circle or, or you had to be in it to know about it kind of thing. And there was, mm -hmm. there was a strand of thought that was the internet purely speaking, should be free to everybody and everyone. So the, the whole notion of monetizing uh, or, or charging for uh, domain names was disruptive to that group of individuals. How, how did they respond and, and was, that, was that a challenge as a part of the process? They responded very negatively uh, because the entire technical infrastructure of the internet for many years as it evolved from 1962 and its first funding uh, up to when we bought Network Solutions was basically a bunch of technical geeks, and I say that lovingly. I'm one of those kind of people. But they, were, they thought the internet should be free. And, you know, think about the services you all use today with the different companies, the, the hundreds and thousands that have sprung up over the internet years. There's still this tension about 
which of those companies ever can make money, right? And the whole thought was for all those years by the technology community, the internet should be free. It should be a global resource open to every human being on earth. Well, I can tell you that unless we had come up with a monetization model, and we were one of the very first companies to come up with a subscription-based model, uh, everybody else looked to us that built internet companies. How are these guys making money? Um, so this was a complex set of things where there was a whole community who was very negative about us and network solutions. They didn't want anybody to charge for anything. If the private sector had not figured out how to do this and charge for it, we would not be using the internet like we know it today. It might still be a very small technical thing that doesn't run the trillions of dollars of global commerce. So how did you charge? What, what was the fee? Uh, we struck an agreement with the National Science Foundation where we would charge um, $50, so it was $100 <coughs> for two years, and the National Science Foundation would get $15 of that to put in something called the Internet Infrastructure Fund. So this was for enhancements to the global internet structure. So that was <coughs> the original pricing, and then we cut it down to $70, $35 a year. So, so, so of that $50 initially, $15 was going to this fund for the mm -hmm. architecture, the, the, the governmental uh, inputs on the architecture, and $35 per domain name was going to Network Solutions, now part right. of SAIC. Right. So, so from... Uh, 1996, you see your revenue at about $2.3 million, and at the end of 1998, it's all, already up in the $14, $15 million. So this is just a rapid, rapid um, right. growth. So part of, part of um, the process of um, Network Solutions is, you know, as you talked to us at the beginning, there was a purchase for $4.7 million, mm -hmm. which now in retrospect seems remarkable. And then there was a sale for $19.3 billion. So, so how, d how did you, along the way, prepare the company for that type of growth, um, keep pace with it so that you weren't outstripped by the growth, and, and then ultimately know when to sell this thing? Mm -hmm. All great questions. I, I would say that there are three lessons in your question. Um, I've always believed, and I've worked with lots of companies that we have built and sold or taken public or kept over the years to all kinds of buyers all over the world. Uh, there are three components to your answer. W one is, how do you do this? Um, and how do you keep up with all this? First and foremost, um, you, you need to identify the right market. So we were fortunate that the market came along. You need a dynamically growing global or commercial, domestic market that is so big that even if you bet partially wrong, you'll probably succeed versus a market that is not going to grow. So we had that. Number two, you hire, uh, however you can find them, the best science, technology, financial management people in the world, and you bring them to your company. That is the key ingredient. If the chemistry is right, the people are smart, they're honest, they're hardworking, they never give up, and they have a central laser beam focused mission of what you're going to do to be number one in your industry, more than not, you will succeed. I've seen this time and again. So we lured the very best people we could get out of the United States government and out of the technology community who came to Network Solutions. And uh, they came because this was one of the hottest companies in the world. And number two, we offered everybody stock options. So they thought there's a high probability we're going to make a lot of money. And number three, <coughs> excuse me, I'd say we brought in the best science and technology talent and we started to pour money into it because unless you could build the infrastructure with the right people to keep up with this, the whole company would have imploded. So one of the remarkable things, when we talk about entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan, it's easy to get into this space. It's about, it's about starting a company sort of unto its own. It's, it's, uh, it's a company that you're focusing on customer discovery and, and the marketplace, but you're not necessarily thinking about the policies that sort of gird, undergird and support and, and permit this activity to take place. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's clear out of this book, well, two things. The first is that, interestingly, the government for Network Solutions and for SAIC was an important client. Um, and two, that the government played a, a critical role in forming, and, and you are part of this, in forming and shaping policy that allows some of these mechanisms in these big industries 
um, to actually function so that the rest of us can, can build these other types of companies. Can you talk to us a little bit about sort of your view from the inside, seeing all that process and the importance of the government and, and what students ought to be thinking relative to the government and entrepreneurship? Mm -hmm. it's, it's very important that over your career you build relationships with people who are in your customer bases, whether they're commercial or government clients. Um, the more you get to know people over the years, the more you build up a relationship, a personal relationship and trust. And people know that you're good for your word. And that is so important, I can never tell you. Um, you know, everybody wants us to paper everything over, which we all do with lawyers, but you need to find people inside government agencies who are senior people, and it's all very transparent. There's nothing bad about it. It's the way the world works and should work that are smart enough to understand that they can figure out with private industry, and in our case, network solutions, how to do the right thing for the country, how to do the right thing for a business, and how to do the right thing for the federal government. And, and I'd say, David, we spent um, months and months and months, and it ended up being years during Network Solutions, uh, working with lawyers, financial people, contract officers, and senior officials of many government agencies who were all involved in this. And, and I, I give a unbelievable salute and debt of gratitude to key people who were at the Department of Commerce, the White House, the National Science Foundation. These were people who understood uh, one thing centrally, which we all talked about. Um, we want to do the right thing for everybody in the United States of America, and we want to do the right thing for everybody in the world. And this internet could become the mechanism that builds thousands of companies and creates trillions of dollars of commercial commerce. We did start to see the possibility of that. And so the way we negotiated these agreements, and we worked with people on Capitol Hill, we had to get political support for a lot of that, both Democrat and Republican, House and Senate people. Uh, it was hundreds of people literally negotiating, talking, and building a basis of trust to do the right things. This is the way things like this should work between the United States government and the private sector in this country. So when the sale of the company happened, um, two things were, were possible then in SAIC at least. Um, one, because of SAIC's employee ownership model of, of um, uh, distributing wealth within the company, there were certain employees got to receive some benefit of that sale presumably. And two, the, the, the company, SAIC, was able to then um, take some of uh, those assets and reinvest them in other sectors. How did you see that process enhance SAIC's long-term growth and, and um, prosperity as a, as a company? Mm -hmm. uh, there are two answers to that, and I think the first answer is uh, when we bought Network Solutions, uh, I went to Bob Beister, who was a CEO and founder, and Bob and I talked for many months about doing this. And we talked about whether to bring Network Solutions into a much larger technology, science technology company, SAIC, or whether to keep it outside. Uh, from day one, my argument was, we need to keep it as a separate subsidiary. Why was that? Because SAIC was a large government contractor. The government contracting mentality space, the types of people who work in those places, who are great people, great company, um, are, are just not an entrepreneurial, fast growth, high ramp up business. These are companies that are great companies that are built on solid financial bases over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. SAIC was started in 1969, so you know it's 40, 44 years old, right? Um, Network Solutions was gonna be in the middle of the dot-com revolution where everybody was nuts. You know, everybody in that company that I brought in worked literally 18 hours a day, six or seven days a week for five years. People literally kill themselves because if you didn't, you couldn't keep up with it. That is what a fast growth, high intensity uh, company in the tech industry in boom days looks like. And did anybody regret it? No, people would sleep there. People would not go on vacations. People would stay because they saw that this was an unbelievable opportunity to do something that no one in the world had ever done before. So, you know, those were kind of the ingredients, and inside SAIC, 
uh, SAIC used the $2.3 billion that we got out of all the offerings as SAIC sold down its shares and Network Solutions became a public company and was basically owned by public investors. Um, that money was reinvested in SAIC, and not only did the stock price of SAIC uh, in those days uh, go up dramatically, so all the employees who owned stock in the company uh, got an enormous amount of wealth out of that. But the other money was reinvested and literally helped SAIC grow larger for the next 10 years. So I want to provide an opportunity for students to ask some questions. But before we do, can you briefly describe to us, you know, you've, you, you've clearly been a part of some waves and some trends. Um, the Internet is no small trend. But I remember when I was uh, living in Europe and thinking how lucky the Europeans were to be able to text so easily <laughs> and come back to the States. And it, 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 at this time, which is now some years ago, mm -hmm. texting was really hard. I mean, you got charged to receive text sometimes, to do text. It was just, people didn't do it. It wasn't a part of the culture. Mm -hmm. You changed that, Mobile 365. Can you just quickly describe that company and then we'll open up to student questions. Uh, sure, all of you who are tech statics with SMS or MMS, uh, Mobile 365, after I stopped working at SAIC in 2004, I've basically been involved in helping people all around the country build high growth technology companies, either private equity, venture capital, whatever. Uh, Mobile 365 was a company based again in Northern Virginia in the Washington area, and these were very smart wireless mobility technical guys who came from other companies, and they put together Mobile 365 with three founders, and they transported the technology from Europe, so they were the company that built the largest single global network that attached, uh, uh, connected, the largest number of mobile operators globally. So we connected 800 mobile operators globally with any device could run on that network. So we are the people who brought SMS and MMS in a big way to the United States of America, and we ended up selling that company in 2006 to Sybase in Silicon Valley, which was then bought by SAP for $6 billion. Since I text all the time, Personal thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you did. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure everyone else here feels the same. I'd like to open it up quickly for a few questions from the students. A uh, reminder that this is being videoed. Yep, straight up here. Yeah, I know you mentioned that you say that we have to put so much trust in the government in our relationship with it. Uh, that said, I was wondering what are your thoughts on the recent NSA revelations with the Dragnet collection and the uh, prism systems that so far, from our understanding, we have private companies giving away our data to the government, and then they're taking that metadata for our own safety, they say. But I was wondering what your opinion on that matter is. Is your question really about the current NSA and the things you're reading yeah, about? Yeah, from the, being someone that you said you worked on the National Security Council. And yeah. so I'm sure you guys have discussed the type of technology that goes in, that's involved with those programs, maybe, to some extent. And I was just wondering what your opinion is going forward in the technology industry in the relationship between private companies and the government, particularly the NSA, and do you see it getting worse or getting better or uh, going forward, what, what's gonna happen with the NSA essentially? Yeah, it's a great question and I don't have a good answer for you. I'd tell you that the debate in the technology industry in this country has gone on for probably a good 20 years about where the lines are for privacy and security in the private sector versus the government. The government under legislation in this country, NSA in, in particular, has always had the ability to tap into uh, these kinds of companies, uh, especially in the internet business. They've, they've done that, we now know it, it's on the record. So, um, you know, it's a very blurry line and I think the only way it's ever gonna be resolved is um, for continued political resolution. That'll have to be done in Washington, frankly. Uh, at the congressional level where there will be their executive orders out of the White House or the Congress will simply say there's some framework where you can only go this far down the line. There, there are lots of checks and balances in that system. Uh, you've read about some of them, but as the internet has pervaded everybody and every place in the world, uh, it's a really good question and I don't think anybody has a very good answer. Uh, the government's answer has tended to be, you know, we need to collect lots and lots and more and more and more, uh, but it's clear that in some areas a lot of people have a lot of trouble with that. So it's not an easy one to resolve, and most of the Internet companies have a big problem with it these days, as you know. Not easily resolved. Yep. 
Um, my question is a bit, I guess, more cheerful. You mentioned startup companies in Virginia, Network Solutions, and then this Mobile 365. How would you say the startup culture is over there as opposed to in the Valley or in New York? Uh huh. Um, the answer is these are very different places. Um, uh, and and I'd, be, I'd be simple about it because I give this talk in Silicon Valley in Washington and at different tech conferences around the world. What's the difference between the greatest concentration of advanced science technology degree personnel in the United States resides in the Washington, D.C. area, primarily in Northern Virginia. Um, Silicon Valley has fewer degreed people, but is a totally different culture. The, the, the difference is, well, Northern Virginia uh, does not have the type of entrepreneurial culture that the valley does, no place does in the world. That's why people still go to the valley. The differences are, and they're not bad or good, they're just the differences. In Northern Virginia, most of the great tech companies that have been started, not all, but most, have been started by people who worked in the United States government or in the military. And they are people who did not start their companies to make money. They started their companies to help the United States of America. And I can tell you, because I'm one of those people, and I know everybody who started every company there for 40 years that's ever grown to be successful. Uh, Silicon Valley is, I never met a CEO in Silicon Valley. I shouldn't say that, I met a few, but hardly any who ever worked in the United States government or ever worked in the United States military. I've asked a question in conferences over the years in Silicon Valley, how many of you started your company here to help the United States of America? I've had maybe two or three hands out of hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, so if you want to chase the next big thing, and it's worth chasing lots of times, I'm a guy who says it is, uh, and you want to make a lot, a lot, a lot of money, you should go to Silicon Valley. These are different cultures and different places. There's a very robust technology entrepreneurial sector that really has been since, I'd say, the 1980s in Northern Virginia when Bill McGowan started MCI. I mean, he was really the guy who deregulated the telecom industry. Then in the 90s, Network Solutions, Steve and the guys with AOL, on and on. We were the net, you know, when we were the internet guys. You got a real combination of a robust entrepreneurial environment. New York's hot at the moment, but it doesn't hold a candle in terms of either volume or numbers of people to either Northern Virginia or Silicon Valley. Well, I would love to ask more questions and have the opportunity. For those of you who want to ask more questions, uh, Mike will be around here along with Marianne to um, answer those for a few minutes afterwards. The book. Names, Numbers, and Network Solutions is on sale here for $20. Thank you for starting your book tour here. University of Michigan, join me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, David.